Coates, and I'm the team of the new adult librarian at the Kingston Frontenac Public Library. And I'd like to introduce Eva Bolan. And Eva is from the Alameda, Alameda, Alameda Free Library. And Eva's going to be talking today a little bit about uh, how you can do some smaller programming in libraries with comics. Um, I'm going to be, I actually ran a Comic Con in Kingston this March, so I'm going to tell you all about that. And then we're going to end with Sven Larset, and Sven is from Super Cuts, a publishing company. And Sven is going to talk about how you can work with publishers to put on your own Comic Con at uh, the library or school. And of course, we're going to end with our panel, so we're going to end with questions. So think of your questions as we're going, and we'll have a full half hour to answer them. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. So, um, what I'm talking about is uh, what do you do if you want to throw a great big event, but you have a teeny tiny little staff. And by teeny tiny, um, in my particular case, it's me. There was just one person, and the comic book uh, program that I did, um, or that, that I've done for several years, is a Free Comic Book Day. Free Comic Book Day is something that we've done since the inception of the event. Trust me when I say you won't need notes. Okay. It's gonna be, this is, okay. yeah, you're good. Um, each year this event gets bigger, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and there's still just me to run it. Um, one of the, the, the event is getting bigger, the staffing limitations has not changed at all. Um, and generally it's me coming into the library on my day off, running this event, and going home exhausted. Um, but, the more I do it, the easier it gets to plan it. Um, if you can grab one or two volunteers, I highly recommend it, but in a lot of our situations, we're in teeny tiny branches um, where staffing is limited, and if you want to get something done, you have to do it yourself. So think of this as a craft program on steroids. Um, things that you need to think about. What age ranges are you marketing this event to? Free Comic Book Day could easily be for all ages. And by all ages, I mean, you know, five years old through 80 years old. Um, I, because I run the children's department, I, my program is geared towards the kids. Um, how many stations can you manage at one time? This is a craft program on steroids. Can you only manage one craft at a time? I, I, can, I have learned over the years that I can handle up to three stations at one time by myself but I have to be very specific about what kinds of things I'm doing at those stations. Where do you get your ideas? All over the place. Um, and can I really do this all by myself? You can. Um, you need to do all of the same kind of planning that you would do if you were doing a craft program. Uh, you just want to incorporate as much as you possibly can. So my first step is always to make friends with my local comic book store. First find out, do you even have a local comic book store? There are lots of communities that don't. Diamond Comics has made it very easy for you, provided you plan ahead of time. Starting in about January, February, if you go to the Free Comic Book Day website and say, I ain't got no comic book store they will send you a box of comics. They will make it possible for you to still have an event. <coughs> but again, planning is everything, and you have to plan early. How, do you, how many comics should you order? Um, think of it, <laughs> first you need to decide how many comics you want to pass out per person. I tend to do one per person, because I do have comic book stores in my neighborhood. Um, I tend to go one per person, and then if they want more, please go visit your local store. Um, this is supposed to be a community event, and I try to get the community involved and get them to as many of the local stores as in the area as I can. And that's also why I don't feel bad only ordering the children's comics, because I tell the grown-ups, go to your local comic book store, find out where it is, go see what they have for you. I'm the children's department, I'm worrying about your kids. I say it nicer than that. Um, how do you pass them out? I'm all by myself. I put them on a table, and I put up a sign that says, one per person, please, and I use the honor system. Granted, the honor system only works with honorable people, so you are going to have some loss, 
But it's also a really easy way to keep track of how many people came through. You count how many comics you started with, you subtract how many comics you have left, you know how many people came to your program, kind of. Um, and then I'll double it for all of those parents who didn't pick one up for themselves because I count everyone who comes into the room. When necessary, I will count myself. What do you do if you run out of comics? You send them to the local comic book store. You keep a note in the back of your head that says I need to order more next year, and you just run with it. Passive programming can be your friend in a situation where you're trying to run a big event with a very small staff. Do you have a movie license? If so, use it. There is no shame in passing out coloring sheets. Coloring sheets makes a lot of kids very, very happy, and a lot of times you can pull in the parents into the coloring as well, because as we know, thank you bestseller list, adults like to color also. Um, I had coloring sheets out um, where it was just the body of a superhero. I had a um, uh, male superhero, female superhero, and it was up to the child, or the adult in this case, to create the costume, and they just went nuts for this. And this was, one of the, this was one of my three stations that I didn't have to watch other than making sure that there were enough coloring sheets on the table. So you can do that. Button machines. Most libraries, I like to think most libraries, have a button machine. Oh my god, people lose their minds over making buttons. Make little tiny circles of superhero symbols or Hello Kitty symbols or Sailor Moon symbols. Put them out on a table, let them cut them out, glue stick it onto a template for the button, run it through a button machine, you'd think you'd handed them a pile of gold. They love this stuff. This is going to be one of, this is a labor intensive station because you've got to operate the button machine, but these kids just go nuts for it and so do their parents. I've used button machines at adult programs too. You'd think these ladies had never put anything, never worn a brooch before. It was, a, it was just amazing. So, think, so don't think that everything has to be all hands-on, all interactive. Um, you're not turning this into a maker space. Um, this is something that, that you've, got, you've gotten them in the door by promising them a free comic book. You're getting them to stay with some, pro, with some programming, um, possibly a movie at the end, and it'll be fine. Take advantage of where you live and what's going on around you. Free Comic Book Day or any kind of program that you want to do, um, whether it's Free Comic Book Day or not, if you're have, trying to run a big program and you're trying and you have to do it by yourself, take advantage of your community. Um, CBLDF has just released uh, the Comics Connector. Comics Connector. So go to the CBLDF website, cbldf.org. And you and um, comic book creators have put themselves on the, this list if they are willing to do school and library visits. So there might be comic book creators in your area that you didn't even know about, so go take a look. What do you do if, if you live in the back of beyond and there's nobody but you and some cows and some chickens and your library? It's still okay because you're gonna have an art teacher. You're gonna have a comic book enthusiast. You're going to have somebody who knows how to make something that does something with comics. You just need to figure out who that person is. You also have Skype. You also have Skype. Thank you very much. You also have Skype. So if you can set up um, a Skype visit with a creator during Comic Book Day, that would be an amazing thing. And all you need is a, pr is a computer, a projector, and a screen. Actually, you don't even need a screen. You need a blank wall. You need something to, to project it on and you need questions to ask the creator. And I'll be honest, a lot of the creators have done this enough at this point that they've got a pattern, and, and you can kind of just sit back and make sure that there are enough coloring sheets on the, on the other station while this is going on. So know who these folks are. Are there other events that you can borrow ideas from? This year, you're gonna have a bonanza of ideas because one of the, at least in the US, I don't know about Canada, I'm sorry, um, at least in the U.S., one of the themes for summer reading this year is superheroes. And there are so many superhero, comic book, comic related, comic adjacent ideas floating around right now. This is when you just start collecting them, putting them in a file, stashing them away for later. Because the free comic book day is not going away and all of these ideas can be stolen, borrowed, 
adapt it for what you need to have happen. And find out, if you're in a community that has other comic book shops, find out what other free comic book day events are going on. Is there something you can piggyback on? We were lucky enough to have Ingrid and Nick Dragoda um, live right down the street from the library. Nick Dragoda has done Fantastic Four. He's doing East of West. He also wrote a book called How Tunes, which is basically a book that is full of maker ideas. It's done in comic book form. It's amazing. Our kids are going nuts for it. They came in and actually did a couple of the activities from the book. Um, and we got, we got them to come into the library free because Nick was going to be doing um, a program at our local comic book shop. So he came into ours, was there for an hour and a half, then just got in the car and drove across town and did his other one. So we were able to piggyback on their event, um, borrow their creators just for a couple of hours, but it, um, it transformed our event which would have been a, you know, your normal, ordinary library event into something really special. Here's a sample schedule of what we did for um, Free Comic Book this year. Um, 9 a.m., I came in. We have a, a nice big community room that's about half the size of this room. Um, set up the table. I set up the, the tables. I set up the chairs in the front of the room for the movie that we were going to show later so that I didn't have to try to rearrange things midway. Um, I put up... Uh, an easel so that Nick could draw. I hid my lunch in a corner because I knew that there was there were going to be very few opportunities for a break. At 11, we had our regular weekly toddler story time. This is a library. You can't just cancel all of your regularly scheduled programs or you're going to have some very cranky adults. Um, and not to mention some cranky toddlers. So, you, there's, so no fair uh, canceling other events in order to hold yours. It's, it's not good PR. Um, 11 a.m. So we ran our program officially started at 11, and it went until 4 o'clock. So at 11 to 5, we passed out comics while supplies last. Be sure you tell folks that it's while supplies last, um, and that way there are a lot. It's a lot easier to say we're out. You need to go to the, you need to go to your local comic book store. Um, the more upfront you are with your expectations, the easier it is to run an event by yourself. Um, 11 to 12.30 is when we had the special event. That's when Nick and Ingrid came in. Um, if you expect a crowd, this is when you want to make sure you have a, volunteer, a couple of volunteers. Um, you, don't, you, don't need, you don't necessarily need somebody for the entire day, but when you're, if you're expecting a crowd, do the best you can. We still didn't. It was still just me, Nick, and Ingrid, um, and we made it work. Uh, 11.31, give yourself a chance to get rid of your special event, bring out your regular station stuff, um, go, go to the bathroom, grab something to eat, because the people aren't going to stop coming. And if it's just you, you have to make do. Um, we had the crafts running the entire time, but we started the movie at 3. Um, the movie was in the front of the room, the crafts were in the back of the room, so that you, when you have the little kids come in who aren't going to be interested in the movie, there was still enough stuff for them to be doing while the older kids and the parents are watching the movie, that everybody is happy. Um, four o'clock, we started cleaning up the crafts, waited for the movie to end. The movie ended 20 minutes before the library closed, so that we were cleaned up and out the door, and we didn't actually have to go into overtime. So it is possible to do it completely by yourself. Don't forget to take pictures. Marketing, 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 marketing. Um, put it on your Facebook page. Hey, look at what we did. Um, put it on your Twitter. This was an amazing event. Um, if, you, if your library has an Instagram account, throw those pictures out there. Get, make sure City Hall knows what you were doing and how responsive people were and that families were excited. Um, the, the more attention you bring to your program this year, the more people are going to remember and want to do it next year. And just keep reminding them, this is a, a, a program that happens every single year. It's always the, third, the first Saturday in May. We're always going to do something. It's always going to be great. So, um, so don't be afraid. Don't be shy. Don't hide your light under a bushel. Get it out there. It's going to make um, you look good. It's going to make your library look good, which is going to make your director happy, which is going to make it possible for maybe uh, her to let you have a staff member help you next year. <laughs> and that's my presentation. Okay, so if you have a little bit of a bigger budget and a little more 
staff time to spend developing a common fund. That's what I was involved in at the Kingston Frontenac Public Library. So we ran a, our own little mini con. Um, we called it King Con, because of course it's Kingston. Um, I put it right there. And I have handed out, I have handouts, so I've handed out the poster and the schedule of events to some of you. I have more left, so if you'd like one, you can collect it at the end. So, uh, this came to fruition around um, September. Uh, I was a brand new librarian at the Kingston Frontenac Public Library, so I'm a teen and new adult, I deal with ages 13 to 30, which tends to fit this demographic. Um, and we approached some local gaming stores and said, hey, uh, have, you, have you thought about running a con before? Um, we don't have one in Kingston. There, people go to Toronto or to Ottawa to access that type of programming, and we thought it would be a good way to uh, reach a different demographic in our community. So we approached Minotaur and Nexus. Those are two local gaming stores in the downtown core of Kingston. And they're pretty close to the library as well, the central library. And it turned out that they had actually run a, a gaming convention before uh, called King Con, and they developed some marketing for it. But uh, due to some unfortunate circumstances, there was actually a, an issue with their venue, of the hotel that they were using. And they, they had to push their con back, and it just had worked out, so we hadn't done anything for about three years. But there was there was a following for King Con, and we decided to expand it and make it bigger and better. And they were really excited to be involved and have the downtown as the venue for the convention. So we ran most of the events in the in the library in our central library. So we have lots of spaces and rooms to do that. But really, the downtown was our venue. So we. We also had events running out of those stores. And then um, Kingston has a university as well. So we tapped into their comic book club, the Queen's Comic Book Club, and got them on board as well. So we had three major partners. Um, and we promoted the con, so we made it a celebration of everything gaming, sci-fi, fantasy, and comic books. We promoted it through social media posters and, of course, a media release. So we actually, on Facebook, we actually created a group, a page for, for King Con. People could like it. And if you're interested in hearing more and kind of following our progress, you can like the page as well. Um, we had, so we had somebody representing from Queens. So he did all of the promotion on campus and things like that. We had posters, so our graphic designer took there, um, that monkey figure there, that was the logo for the previous King Con. So our graphic designer took that and added some other really fun marketing, made posters and things like that, we made banners, and then we just pushed it out to the local newspapers and radio stations, and it was really uh, broadcasted all over town. So our schedule of events, that's included in the handout, but we had over 30 events over the course of three days. And we ran our con, it was the weekend before uh, Comic Con in Toronto. So it, was, it offered an alternative to people, it was around the same time. And we also thought we could sort of piggyback on that and maybe get some of the presenters to come to ours that, that would be around Toronto. It's Kingston's only about two and a half hour drive away. We had gaming tournaments run by our partners, so we had, um, there's some listed over there that an X, Star Wars X gaming tournament, we had a pandemic tournament, we had Magic the Gathering, Dungeons and Dragons, lots of things going on simultaneously in different rooms of the library and off-site. Um, we had broadsword demonstrations, because there's local groups that, that do that, and a cosplay workshop, because there's a cosplay club at Queens, and Victorian self-defense. Lots of demonstrations, uh, drop-in board games, so people could come and, and just play board games if they want. Uh, 
Uh, we also have a trade show on the Saturday. So we had 25 different vendors and tenants, and comic book creators, queens clubs, artists, jewelry makers, and people could just, they could sell their, their wares. This picture is, um, I didn't get a good shot of the trade show, but so we had a, a gaming tournament going on in the middle of the room, then on the outside, we had our vendors. So that was a really popular part. And we also had some special guest speakers. So we were really, really lucky. We got Cecil Castellucci and Scott Chandler. These are award-winning Canadian graphic novelists. Um, and Cecil, actually, she came all the way. She lives in LA, but she's Canadian. So she came all the way from LA to come to our con. Uh, and then Scott Chandler is absolutely amazing. So Cecil focuses on teens. Scott does adults and, and kids. So he did one session for kids, one session for adults. Uh, extras. So we also had our 3D printer out. So we were printing out uh, fandom types of things. We had a button maker. So Eva mentioned that button, button makers are amazing. And they are. That constantly had um, a group of people surrounding it. And we, we used our disc cards. So like old comic books that are in rough condition. We used those to make the buttons. So it was a lot of fun people to come make a button, check out our 3D printer. Uh, and we had Debbie's printed with the King Kong logo on it that we gave away as freebies. We also had a prize table so people could come and check in. And our partners uh, donated prizes to use. We sold, we sold tickets, raffle tickets. Because a lot of the time when you do gaming tournaments, people come out for the prizes. So this is a way to kind of include Everyone didn't cost the library anything to offer it and gave them a bit of incentive if they were participating in the tournament. Uh, and we had stormtroopers, so they were amazing. Um, so we got the stormtroopers to the 501st Legion. So you can go to their website, they volunteer actually. So uh, if you want to get stormtroopers out, uh, do that. And I strongly recommend it. They were a big hit and they advertised our event too. So we had people coming just to see the stormtroopers. And obviously, the Econofon is a bit of a, an adult, more of an adult or teen focus. So it was nice having the stormtroopers there to kind of include the little guys too and the families, give them something to do. And for the families as well, like going to look at the 3D printer, the drop in board games, or the button maker. It's all family friendly. Uh, and then, of course, the demonstrations too. They really like the little guys. Really and stuff like that. Uh, we also did a costume contest. The winner is this little guy in the middle. Um, but as you can see, the event uh, attracted people of all ages. So we had families come out, we had lots of teens, we had seniors, uh, it was just younger adults too. I know it can be hard for libraries to reach those 20 somethings a lot of the time, but this really appealed to them. And what we did with the costume contest, uh, the prize was a $50 gift card to one of the gaming stores that we partnered with. But we, we took pictures of them as they were coming in. And if they wanted to enter, we posted them on our Facebook page. And whoever got the most likes on their picture won the prize. Uh, and it was great. Like we, we haven't had a lot of success with social media um, contests at our library. So this exploded. We have hundreds of people liking these pictures and sharing them and then liking our library page. It was by far the most successful um, social media contest we've had. We also did a king contest, a fan art and fan fiction contest. This was the winning fan art here. Um, so they had to submit that and it was also a nice way to, to offer more prizes and get people thinking about creation and all of the So finally, you're probably wondering, how much did this cost? It's must have been tons of money. Actually, working with our partners, most of, well, every event was free and didn't cost us anything except for our guest speakers. So we applied for a grant from Canada Council for the Arts, and that paid for our speakers. And our friends at the library, they gave us 
so money to spend. So we were able to do that banner there. They paid for that. So that was about $200. Uh, and they paid for accommodations for our guest speakers as well. And we had those dice made to hand out to people. So we had, but you, didn't, you, would, you don't necessarily need to have giveaways. That was just an extra thing. So we were lucky to have that, that bit of extra money. But really like the events and the everything else didn't cost us a thing other than staff time. So I did put a lot of effort into this event. So successes, we had 750 people of all ages in attendance. I have never seen our central library that busy before. It was just crawling with people. And we had the media was there constantly. Uh, it was absolutely amazing. Something about running your own Comic Con that just engages your community. And it was so, so exciting. We got lots of new library card signups as well. Lots of people were coming in that had never been in the library before or didn't know where it was. People were actually going to the gaming stores and saying, where is the central library? I mean, it says a public library made right on it, but it's that event got the attention of the community and reached a demographic that we don't usually see. Uh, increased rapport with local businesses. That was huge as well. Now we've got this great relationship with these gaming stores. Um, they did free comic book day too, and now they're giving us their leftover comics to use for prizes. They'll put up posters and advertise things for us. And they're just really on board and advocating for the library and the community. And I have here reaching new adults. In case you don't know what new adults are, they're, they're the 20-somethings. Um, this, was, this is one of my jobs, is to really reach that demographic. And this event did it. It was great. Um, so that's it. Good morning, everybody. So, the good news that I've got to deliver to you guys is publishers love library conventions. We love them so much that we're actually willing to give you free stuff to give away at your conventions. We're looking to help you any way we can. This first uh, URL that I threw out here, last year Heidi McDonald from Publishers Weekly, who's actually going to be attending TGAF, uh, did a great overview of the trend that's sweeping both the United States and Canada for library conventions. So this is almost like 101, basically, for how to put on a comic con in your library. So when you're looking for stuff to give away, when you're looking for programming ideas, promos, there's a bunch of different people you can go to. Obviously, I'm a publisher. Paper Cuts is a kid's graphic novel publisher, so libraries and teachers are a big part of what we do. But it's not just publishers. As my colleagues up here have been saying, local creators are a terrific resource for you. Local comic book stores. Don't forget art and design schools as well, especially if you're focused on kids. Basically, what you're doing is priming them for the next generation of students that are going to go to the Ontario College of Art or Sheridan College or whatever your local institution is. There are also industry organizations that can help you out, like the Children's Book Council or the CBLDF. My friend Charles Brownstein from the CBLDF is here, and I'm going to ask him to tell you a little bit more about that in a second. But you've got tons <coughs> of places to go to, not just for giveaways, but for information, for resources on how to get this done. So a couple of, you know, I'm here to give you guys <laughs> inside information. Uh, telling it like it is, not all publishers are created equal. I can say this because I used to be the marketing director for Marvel Comics. Uh, which is, you know, the biggest comic book publisher in North America. You know, the company that's going there, you know, the company behind these $250 million movies. I got to tell you, they don't care about libraries that much. Uh, why? Because that's not where their bread and butter is. You know, the core demographic for Marvel is 35-year-old guys. You know, and it's really easy for them to reach those guys. They make a lot of money reaching those guys but they leave it up to a lot of other people to train the next generation of readers. On the other hand, a lot of the people you're gonna see this weekend, John Quirley up in Montreal, First Second, Division of Macmillan, Top Shop, and of course ourselves. You know, there are people who are very dedicated to the library and the educational market, and you'll see that reflected in the materials that they produce as well. There are also graphic novel imprints, traditional publishers. I didn't count First Second in there, even though they're a part of Macmillan. 
but Scholastic, Norton, Abrams, you know, there are plenty of divisions of traditional publishers who've been working with libraries for years and years and know how to get it done. Like I said, Marvel, and to a certain extent, DC, I gotta say, DC is a little better than Marvel when it comes to outreach to libraries. But like I said, they're focused on a different demographic that isn't necessarily your demographic. I'm not saying exclude superheroes from your programming by any stretch of the imagination. That's gonna be the thing that's gonna bring a lot of people to your library. But when you're looking for giveaways, when you're looking for contacts with local creators, when you're looking for that support, you're going to be better off dealing with these smaller imprints of major publishers or with smaller publishers because they've got the people that are actually going to give you that kind of backup. Thing two that you should know is if you want giveaways, you've got to ask for them. You know, and when I say you've got to ask for them, it's really helpful to us as publishers if you tell us what you need. You know, so if you write me a note and you say, hey, we're having a local Minicon at my library, can you send me some giveaways? Well, I'll try and do that, but it's a lot more helpful if you write me a note and say, we're having a convention at our local library, we're expecting 750 people to come, the theme this year is diversity, or you know, it's women in comics, or you know, the theme is summer reading, so it's superheroes. That helps me, that helps anybody say, Okay, I know exactly what I need to send you guys, and I know exactly how much to send you. Second tip for you, asking for books is probably not the thing that you want to do. You know, every publisher is in business to sell books, and we're in business to sell books both to consumers and to libraries. You know, so every time I give a book away, that's a potential missed sale. You know, I'm happy to give away galleys or advanced review copies, but actual physical books, I really only want to do that for prizes, for raffles, that sort of thing. On the other hand, you know, buttons, posters, samplers, I'm more than happy to give that stuff. That's what it's there for. Sign books or something else that people tend to ask for. You know, there's an assumption that, hey, the next time the author is in the office, he can just sign 20 copies and I can ship them out. Unfortunately, the reality of it is that very rarely do we have creators come into our office. For example, we're based in New York City. We have freelancers all over the world. You know, in some cases they're local, but in some cases they may be in <coughs> some case, cases they may be in Europe. So if you're looking for signed copies, you're a lot better going to the creator, better off going to the creator and asking the creator rather than the publisher. Um, here's another weird tip for you. You know, my colleagues have told you planning, 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 and they're right. Whenever you're doing an event like this, you want to get started as early as possible. However, from a publishing standpoint, if you're having a convention in December and you send me a note in January saying, can I get some giveaways? Well, two things are gonna happen. One, I'm not gonna have giveaways or promotional items that are relevant to the content that's being published later on that year, you know, because I'm generally creating this stuff two to three months ahead of time. And also, if you send me something in January, I'm gonna send you a note back saying, great, I love it. Send me a reminder in October or November. You're going to get busy planning your convention. You're going to forget to send me a reminder. I can barely remember what I had for dinner last night, let well, alone um, you know, the notes that somebody sent me in January. So make sure you time it about 8 to 12 weeks out before your event, and then we'll make sure you get you stuff. Guests for your show. One of the most important things, you know, a great driver for programming is having guests come to your show. Sometimes publishers can help you out with that. Don't count on it. There's a couple of things that come into play. One, I spoke about the fact that most of our creators aren't local. There's also like a reluctance on publishers' part to connect with creators, partially because we're bugging them all the time. And you know what we're usually bugging them about is where the heck are those pages you promised to send me last week? You know, our first goal talking to our creators, dealing with our creators, is to get them to deliver material. You know, so even if it's somebody like me working on the marketing side, and I'm like, hey, it'd be great to, you know, this creator could go up to that show, you know, it's like going to be awesome. The editor is going to turn around and be like, you know, they still owe me five pages they promised me last week. We try not to have that kind of conflict. So again, going directly to the creators is the best way to get a creator to come to your show. Uh, you have mentioned that there's a wonderful new tool that actually just launched today called the Comics Connector, which is being provided by the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund as a service to librarians. 
And as if I planned it, Charles Brownstein from the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund is in the front row, so I'm going to let him talk to you about that for two minutes. Sure. Uh, if you go to cbldf.org, cbldf.org, slash resources, slash comics connector, and that's all one word, you'll see that we have started a resource that's going to be updated every week of creators that are willing to come to schools and libraries in their communities for visits. It's organized by country and by state. Right now we've got a little bit more than 50 creators in about a dozen states and one Canadian province, but as I say, we're updating every single week and on there it indicates where the creators are, their email address, what grade levels or age groups they're willing to speak to, what subject levels they're able to address, and whether they require honorariums or not, and also whether they're able to do an internet-based presentation. You may not be able to get somebody like a Raina Telgemeier or a Dave Roman to travel to your location, but you'd be surprised to find that they do frequently do Skype visits, often for a very honest honor, uh, honorarium. Other, visitor, other creators, if they have enough planning time, can do Skype visits for no honorarium. So go to cbldf.org slash resources slash comics connector. It's one of many tools that we provide to help you engage with your community. Thanks, Charles. Thanks, and while you're on that resources page, make sure that you also check out Raising the Reader, which is a CBLDF publication that is constantly being updated, and it's a great thing for you to be giving out at your shows. And well. we have hard copies at the giveaway table here of that if you want them. Well, there you go. It's like we planned this or something. <laughs> um, programming for your show. As I said, publishers can provide content, not just in terms of guests, but we can also give you process content. One of the things that you'll find about people who are interested in this subject matter is it's a very aspirational hobby of interest. You know, almost any kid that reads comics dreams of writing or drawing comics. Uh, even adults coming in at different age levels have that same sort of thing. You know, so we can provide you with tools to sort of tell you how comic books are made. It tends to be something that's terribly interesting to the audience. It's helpful. Uh, sometimes, you know, if you're doing your first event, Definitely, you're going to get some interest just because of the subject matter. It can be really helpful to have a theme for your show, especially if you're in a market with a lot of other programming. Toronto, for example, has got a ton of great comic book conventions. So if you're up in North York or Mississauga or somewhere, and you wanted to do a local convention for your library, it might help to have a theme or to make, tie it in even locally to make it something that's relevant to your audience. Also, look at the strengths of your local publishers. As I mentioned, B&Q is up in Montreal. Uh, you know, there's somebody that could be great for libraries in Quebec to hit up. Uh, but if you're a library in Quebec, say you're in, I don't know, Sherbrooke or somewhere, and you're like, I want to do a convention, and the theme's going to be superheroes. Well, John Cordley is not really a superhero publisher. You know, so they're not going to be able to help you out that much. But if your theme was kids' comics, or your theme was the European influence on comics, or something like that, then you know they could probably provide you with a lot of material. They might drive down from Montreal to help help you guys out with your show. Look at what the resources you've got and what they're doing, and tailor some of your programming to see those trends. Finally, uh, Comics Connector just launched today. It's a great tool with 50 creators, but it's not your only tool. It's a tool that's going to get get better and better as people join up and hear more about it. But take a look at some other things. Take a look at your local schools, like we talked about. Any animation school, any art school is probably going to have somebody on staff who's either a working professional, because I got to tell you, comics is not a way for people to get rich. So a lot of people <laughs> uh, have other jobs apart from being full-time creators. Take a look at shows like Mocha, TCAF, you know, the people are going to support you, they'll be at STX, they'll be at eight. They're the people who are really interested in your channel. It's a big tent. You know, you've heard Liz talk about the stormtroopers coming. People who are into comics, are into animation, they're into gaming, they're into genre films. You could reach out to Cineplex Odeon or one of the other movie distributors and say, hey, how about throwing some of that $200 million marketing budget for the Avengers my way? You know, you'd be surprised how many posters, how many emotional items they'll have to give you as well. 
And also, reach out to your fellow librarians. You know, Mike can tell you that the ALA has a discussion group for graphic novels. Uh, there's probably similar organizations up here in Canada. Look at blogs, uh, the book list block, Good Comics for Kids is great, Graphic Novel Reporter. Uh, there are all these places looking to help you and provide you with information on how to do this. And that's basically me talking about all the stuff that you can get from publishers. I'll tell you, I grew up in Ottawa. I went to school just down the road. So if you're a Canadian librarian, you send me a request, it'll go to the top of the list. If you tell me you're a Toronto Maple Leafs fan, sorry, there's not. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Yeah, okay, so we're going to take questions. Um, so you can direct a question to a specific person, be it Eva, Liz, and Sven, or you can ask a general question that we can all answer. Yeah? Uh, how much did the dice cost? <laughs> they were about $350 for 500 um, they were pretty cool to be able to give out something, and we, we want to do it every year, give out dice, so that people can collect them. But you don't really need them, necessarily. Yeah. Eva, and, and this could be broader to the panel too, but when you're directing folks to their local comic stores, could you speak a little bit about how specifically um, the local businesses and the libraries cross-promote each other, both before, during, and after the event? Sure. Um, I'm, in the, I'm in the greater Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, and there is a wealth of local comic book shops there. And the smart ones already know to contact their local library. That, that free comic book day has gone well beyond um, comic book shops. Um, what I've done is I've created a partnership with the one that's closest to my location. Um, and I. I generally, because I write press releases all the time, I'll do a press release for both of us, saying the, the Alameda Free Library and Alameda Sports Cards and Comics have teamed up to present uh, Free Comic Book Day. Come, uh, come to the library uh, to get a free comic, um, do your crafts, do, do the, you know, and I kind of talk about what I'm doing that day, and then go see what they have at Alameda Sports Cards and, Cards and Comics. Um, and I'll tell all of the programming that she's doing there. So all of our, um, all of our promotion happens jointly. Um, Alameda is a very small town, so if you're in a place like Toronto, it might be a little more difficult to get that kind of buy-in, but if you're in a small town like I am, uh, it's really helpful because it gets, it pulls in, we're on opposite ends of town, it pulls the entire town uh, into the event at once. Um, We've also, uh, in the Greater Bay Area, there's, uh, everybody's very, it's, a, it's kind of like the library world. It's a very small world. So if something fabulous is going on, on in Alameda, the Berkeley store is gonna know about it. If something wonderful is going on in Berkeley, they're gonna talk about what's happening in Fremont. Um, and you, you will find people going all over the Bay Area, collecting books all over, free comics all over the Bay Area, meeting different creators. Um, t uh, dropping in at different libraries because we're all talking to each other. Does that answer your question? Yep. Yep, you. That's you. I just broke over at the USMED. So when dealing with publishers and big companies that produce comics and these things, what would be the best way for us, you know, who we contact and how to sort of get the best response in a kind of manner? and to sort of help us uh, deal with the so that our, our request cannot sort of jump to the bottom of the pile. Sure. Uh, I would say that in most cases, you're going to be looking to contact either the marketing or the PR person at those companies. And in, in a lot of cases, what you're going to find is that person will actually be listed in the credits. Uh, you know, if you look at many of the graphic novels that are out there, you'll see a listing of corporate people. Uh, that you usually just skip over because you're like, wow, that's boring. <laughs> uh, but those are the people that you're going to want to get in touch with. Uh, you'll also see if you look at any sort of you know trade coverage of these companies, that's usually the person who's giving the quote. You know, so if you go in that Publishers Weekly article, for example, you know, I'm quoted in that article. Uh, I think John Cunningham from DC Comics is quoted. So John obviously would be the person to reach out at DC. The other thing is 
we all know each other. It's a relatively small industry. Uh, so if you make a contact with one company, you can say, oh, by the way, who should I be speaking to at Top Shelf, or who should I be speaking to at Dark Horse? Uh, Charles and I are actually part of a discussion group of kids, graphic novel publishers, uh, that meets on a semi-monthly basis. And we basically are all getting together, either in person or by phone, to talk about you know, industry issues and how we can continue to promote the category. And I guarantee you librarians are always a big part of that conversation. So, you know, if you make me aware of something, you know, odds are I'll bring it up in the next meeting and I'll be talking to my friends at IDW or a Dark Horse or Image about it as well. I got to tell you, we love schools just as much as we love libraries. <laughs> um, school librarians are probably our favorite people. Uh, I think that one of the keys there is that you know we will work with you just as much. Uh, we are, like I said, specifically a kids-only publisher. Uh, so when you are looking at working with publishers, you may want to look at people who are actually providing educational material as well. So, for example, ourselves. Tune Books, uh, Scholastics Graphics Imprint, I believe Abrams does this as well, Viz is another publisher. All of them provide educator guides or lesson, lesson guides, uh, to, you know, which sort of does two things. One, it helps out the teachers and it's also a red flag that these are people who are very willing to work with schools. I'll tell you from experience, one of the things that school teachers and librarians run into a lot is uh, back, there's always one parent in every, every group who's like, ah, I don't want to read graphic novels, I want to read real books. And it's like, you know, because that's, you know, graphic novels, that's when you want to take a look at people like Scholastic, for example, has a great publication about all the benefits of reading graphic novels for kids and how it can help, not just with reluctant readers, but with all kids in terms of, like, you know, processing information, you know, and there's, you know, a horrible, to some people think in the states called Common Core, uh, you know, and we have Common Core guides where we're basically saying, hey, look, it says right in there, you know, your state and local governments are telling you that kids need to learn how to process information this way. Graphic novels are the best way to do that. You know, so uh, the one, one other thing I'd say about school stuff is that you're probably going to want more promo items than you might otherwise want at the library because you just don't have as many programming options. Usually you're doing it in the gym or in one or two classrooms. And there's not as many stations as you might have at like Eva's convention. Um, if I, if, do you mind if I jump in? Uh, a, a program, and my presentation was very um, topic specific. I was talking about a specific program that I had done. But what I was doing could very easily be done in, in a utility room in a, in a middle school or an elementary school or even a high school. Um, and a lot, there are a lot of public libraries that would love the opportunity to partner with a school library on a program like this. Um, everything that I did in my library could easily be moved to, um, to an auditorium. Uh, um, or one of those multi-purpose rooms that you see in a lot of the more modern schools. Um, we could either, we could also, you know, uh, I would be happy to partner on getting the free comics. I would be happy to partner on helping to find guests. I would be happy to do any of that. Just give me the opportunity. Um, be willing to open up your door to, to making that possible. Um, another thing to consider is uh, whether or not you're allowed to use that room on the weekends. And if you are, you could completely revolutionize special programming at the school. Um, if, if you could, could step outside the school day um, and make it make this uh, a, kind of an extracurricular event event, uh, that could be pretty fantastic. And I'll comment. Can you hear me? I'll comment a little bit as well. Um, so one thing when we ran our King Con, um, we had our two authors visiting and they they did two uh, presentations at the library the, on the Friday. 
so during the school day. And I called every single school in Kingston and was not able to get a class to come and see these award-winning authors. So we would love to partner on something like that, right? We, like we could have made, we could have done more programming on the Friday as well and partnered with a school or several schools and arranged a field trip or did some off, done, or we could have done some off-site visits as well. So I think definitely partnering with your public <coughs> library. Like we love to hear from, from school librarians and we love to work together and it's a great way for us to reach students and young people at the schools. If your school has limitations, like um, in my in my particular school district, uh, the permission slips have to go out a month ahead of time. The the program has to be approved three months ahead of time. By if you have those kinds of restrictions, let your public library know because a lot of times we will know that we're going to be having an awesome event coming up. But if we don't know that you have to know three months in advance we're going to have completely missed that opportunity. So the conversation does have to go both ways. If you want this stuff to happen for your students, you have to let us know. Yeah, I guess one final code out on that, you know, because again, as I keep mentioning, my company only publishes kids' graphic novels, but be aware of all the content that's being published by a company before you approach them. You know, some Companies have a much more diverse product range than we do, and some of that content is very, very adult. So that doesn't preclude them from participating, but you need to be aware of that so that when some parent comes up to you with, you know, a copy of something that's obviously intended for an adult audience, and it's like, you know, hey, you're partnering with these people who are promoting smut to our kids, but you're actually not being caught by surprise there that you know that it's, that's going on. the cause of the convention to your senior board and, and sort of convey the need to run this program with the library because as you read some of the old blogs and Harold and I come up with like we do programming and whatnot, it's usually senior board and directors that uh, so what did you do to sort of draw your I want to hear this too. <laughs> <laughs> I have to preface this by saying that I'm really lucky to the Kingston Frontenac Public Library is really open to new ideas. And actually, my position had been newly created at the library, so I started just uh, a year ago, so in June. And I was able to, they were looking for new ideas, and I was able to, to try a whole bunch of things this, this year. <coughs> so I wrote, wrote up a proposal for it, and, and then had sort of a preliminary meeting, and, um, and was able to, you know, other libraries have tried Comic Cons before, so I was able to point to that and how successful those have been. And it just seemed a natural fit with our mission and vision, too. So just going through your library's mission and vision and picking out statements that relate directly to, to what the con would bring, that helped. And really, they were quite supportive, and especially after getting the current on board, so putting the feelers out there to see who would be interested. And um, this, this, the King Con was actually probably our biggest event that we ever ran at the library before. It got the biggest crowd that had ever been seen. So next year it's just going to be bigger and better. So just getting the permission to try something, and then once it's successful, you can build on it. But I was lucky, I know not every library be that receptive. Thank you very much. Can I can I ask a question to all of you guys? How many uh, Canadian librarians are here? Okay. You guys have a great resource that your American colleagues don't have uh, that I was just so intrigued to hear about. You know, the Canada Council. God, I'm is, so jealous is of this. Amazing. You have no idea. Uh, you know, the fact that you were able to get a grant from them to bring creators in is fantastic. And it sort of leads into something that I wanted to tell you again. This is a bit inside baseball. There are so many Canadian creators working in comics, it's not fun. Mm -hmm. uh, not just here, you know, in Canada, but there are also a number of Canadian creators living full-time in the States. 
Todd McFarlane, one of the founders of Image Comics, is from Edmonton. Uh, you know, John Byrne, who was one of the top comics creators in the 80s and 90s from Calgary. Even in sometimes there's a family connection. Brian Bond, who's writing Saga, one of the hottest comics out there right now, his wife is from Ottawa. So, you know, don't be afraid to approach people, especially if you know that there's a Canadian connection. You know, because you may actually get the council though to fund them. You may also get them to just come up here because it's a nice place to visit. Uh, they may have family up here. They may want to take a holiday. Uh, don't underestimate Canada and the appeal of Canada as a destination for these people. That's my sort of patriotic. <laughs> <laughs> We have about five more minutes. Are there any other questions? Are you all going to go and try to do some? Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs>
Queens, the university. So check out like your local university and see if there's any any clubs uh, that have, do stuff like costuming or um, things like that. Comic books. Our, our Queens Comic Book Legion. At, it's, we're so lucky to have them in Kingston because they've actually published their own comic book. So they were able to sell that and, and do a workshop on. Um, do a workshop on like how to create your own comic that was really popular. And we had, so like we have local broadsword um, groups that came in and uh, a special kind of a martial arts group. So they set up a booth. Just lots of, we sort of like mined <coughs> the community for who would be interested in this. And then, um, and really it's those partners that know those people. Because I, I certainly don't know. I wouldn't have known who to approach. It would have taken a lot of research and things like that. But if you partner with with those local movers and shakers and gaming and comic books, they can like go and teacher and me because I just didn't feel like I knew enough to jump in yet. Right? I'd, I'd make one other suggestion to you because you're local here in Toronto. Uh, you guys have got a great human resource. Mark Asquith, who oh is the executive producer for Space, has been doing that for half his life. Before that, he was at TVO doing Prisoners of Gravity. Uh, he's probably one of the best connected people in the comic book industry. And he ran Silver Snail Comics before he did Prisoners of Gravity. Uh, he's good friends with the people at Back of Books. You know, just sending Mark an email or a Facebook message, he's got a pretty big social media presence. He can probably give you like five or 10 people right away if you want to come do something. And he'll probably be here this weekend. Yeah, yeah. I think I'm having a beer with him at four o'clock. Actually, <laughs> ask with A S K W I T H. It's lunchtime. <laughs> Thank you guys Thank you. for all your advice. Um, so it's lunchtime now from twelve thirty until two o'clock. So if you paid for lunch.